Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, thanking you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together as the body of Messiah, as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you would just open up our hearts and minds to your word, to what you would have us to know, what you want to say to us, and help us to be able to apply these things to our heart and our life and our mind, because everything that we say and do depends on the word of God. All the issues we have in life, all the questions we have in life, all the problems we face, the solutions are found in your word. And uh, Lord, we don't seek out your word enough. We don't research your word enough. We worry, we fret, we, care bur we carry burdens that aren't even ours to carry. But if we would just take time and just search and seek out your word and allow the Holy Spirit to guide our heart and mind through the word, we would get the answers that we need. And so, Lord, tonight I pray that this message would help build, educate, fortify, build up the believers so that we could be more efficient and proficient in our spiritual warfare against the enemy. So we ask and pray these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So, most of you have been parents. Or at least you've maybe watched little kids, babysit kids. Um, how do kids usually get their way? Crying. Throw a fit. Crying, throw a fit. Basically, they don't give up. Yeah. Never. They're like a dog with a bone, right? <laughs> like, you know, if they want something, they will wear you down until they get it. That's what they do. They they try to wear you down. Sometimes it works and sometimes it don't. Obviously, it doesn't work with Linda. She just said, nope. <laughs> but that's their tactic is to wear you down. You know, like, mom, mom, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Can I have ice cream? Can I have ice? No. Can I have ice cream? Can I? And then come back later, five minutes later. Can I have this? No. One of my favorites. Are we there yet? Yeah. <laughs> so their tactic is to wear you down. And that's the way it is in the spirit with the enemy. We have been taught in Christendom that it's a one and done deal. That all we have to do is say some magic words, pray a magic formula, and everything's honky dory and we're fine and the enemy's not going to bother us. That's not reality. If we're honest with ourselves, that's not reality. You know, maybe it's, it's a temporary relief. And they go away for a little bit when we command them to leave because they do respond to the name of Yeshua, to the name of Jesus. But then they seem to come right back. And you're like, wait, I just thought I kicked you out. What are you doing back here? So I was reading through some extra biblical literature uh, this past week. So not only am I trying to read through the Bible, I'm trying to read through the book of Jubilees, the book of Jasher, and the book of Enoch. Uh, this year to kind of refresh myself with those extra biblical texts because these were the texts that the Midrash was based upon. A lot of the Jewish commentary was based on. Uh, the first century believers held these books in high esteem. They didn't believe they were inspired or canonical, but it really helped fill in the gap sometimes of scripture. Uh, sometimes they used it as history. Sometimes they would use it in teaching to kind of bring across the point. So it, it, it held... It, it, it held some sway with the first century uh, believers as well as with the Jewish community. So in the book of Jubilees, in chapter 11, I don't have it with me, so I'm not going to read it, but I'm just going to kind of tell you the story. In Jubilees chapter 11, you have Abraham. And uh, this was before uh, farming implement, implements were made, like the plows and, and, and the modern way of farming. Uh, basically, when they grew things, they just took a handful of seed and just scattered it and just wait till it kind of went to the ground itself. And it was just kind of a crapshoot. What would come up? When would it come up? And what crops would be successful? And a lot of times they would have to stay out there to fend off, you know, to shoo off the ravens and the birds and things because they would eat the seeds, right? So this was kind of the case in Jubilees chapter 11 where they're farming and they're planting. And it says that Satan inspired or told these ravens to go and, you know, eat up the seeds that they were casting out. And as a result, this caused a famine. And people were hurting for food. They were hungry for food. And so God told Abraham to rebuke these ravens because they were satanically inspired. Now, again, this is just folklore. This is not canonical scripture. 
But just like Aesop's fables, we can learn something, a moral, a moral of the story kind of thing from stories like these. And so something jumped out at me when I was reading this. So it said that when the ravens came and started attempting to eat up the seeds that were just thrown out to be sown, Abraham would go out and rebuke them and command them to leave in the name of Yahweh. It wasn't a one and done deal. They left, but guess what? They come back. And it said that Abraham had to turn back the ravens 70 times in one day. 70 times in one day before they finally would leave. Now, just like little children, little children want to wear you down so they can get their way, so they can get that ice cream, or they can watch that TV show, or they can stay up late, or they can, whatever they want, they can get money to buy their new toy, whatever. They will try to wear you down and they won't take no for an answer. And that's the way it is with the demonic realm. Their, their uh, method of operation is to wear you down so that you will give up before they do. Kind of like Survivor. You know, the, remember the TV show Survivor? It's that contest to see who could last the longest. It's out, last, out, wit, out. It's still going. Yeah, it's still going on. So you, you got to hang tough and you got to be the last man standing. So that's the way it is, spiritually speaking. You've got to be the last man standing because <sighs> demons have been around for at least 6,000, maybe 7,000 years. Because we know that demons are the product of the disembodied spirits of the giants. That's what we know to be demons today. They're different than fallen angels. The fallen angels that perpetuated, uh, uh, slept with the human women and created these giants, most of them were punished and they were locked away. And then you have other fallen angels that are running around acting like they're gods. And, you know, they still kind of have a hand in national things. But it's mostly the things we deal with is mostly demons, which are these disembodied spirits of the giants. So they've been around for 6,000 plus years. They're smart. They know all about the human being. They know all about psychology. Just think of being able to accumulate knowledge and experience for 6,000 years. How smart, how cunning, how wise you would be. And waiting 6,000 years for something to happen? That takes a lot of patience. So the enemy is patient, more patient than we are. I mean, we're crying and boohooing if, if God doesn't answer our prayer in five minutes. After all, we can do an internet search and you can see how fast it took the internet to search what you're looking for. 1.8 seconds, 0.58 seconds or whatever. I mean, it's like this. You can get popcorn out of a microwave in three minutes. You can get a pizza delivered to you in 30 minutes. DoorDash or whatever, these, these you know, food hub, whatever, can get food to you within about 30 minutes. If you need a new pair of eyeglasses, it takes about an hour to get eyeglasses. So it's like everything we want can be right now. Everything we want can be at our fingertips. We do not know how to be patient. Like Amazon, it's same day delivery. And in some cases, if a person can't get to you, a drone will fly by and drop your package off. Back in the day, if you ordered something from overseas, it would take months to get here. If you ordered something, you know, from within the states or within Canada, it would take, you know, I remember these old TV shows, those these old commercials that you order something from an 800 number, allow four to six weeks for delivery. Remember that? <coughs> Four to six weeks for delay. No, we don't have to worry about it anymore. We can have it in, a, in the same day if we want. So we have lost the ability to be patient. But we have to learn how to be patient spiritually because the enemy is going to be more tenacious than us. They're going to be more patient than us. And we've got to trust the Father. We've got to trust God. We've got to be, we've got to draw our line in the sand, dig our heels in. And let the enemy know that we will not, you know, let whatever they want to do happen. So in the book of Jubilees, just as Abraham had to turn away these satanically inspired ravens 70 times in one day in order for them to go for good. We might have to do the same thing in our life before we can be delivered from demonic oppression, before we can be healed of something or whatever or, or, or a prayer being answered. We might have to pray over and over for something. So let's see if the scriptures bear this out. And I'm just not talking out of my head. So in Matthew chapter 12, 
verses 43 through 45. Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 43, it says, Now when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, okay, so a demon has just been expelled from a person. They're delivered. It passes through waterless places looking for rest but doesn't find it. Now why is that? Body exactly. Looking for a body to occupy. Because think about this. Let's say that you have an addiction. Whatever the addiction is, drugs, alcohol, you pornography, whatever. The only way you can fulfill that temptation, that lust, that vice, that desire, is through the physical senses of your body. You get high off drugs, you get your nicotine fix, you know, you the endorphins, you know, shoot off in your brain, you know, when you're looking at pornography, whatever. And so that's how you experience the pleasure that's in sin for a short season. Demons can't do that anymore. When they had body as giants, they loved to kill, steal, rape, murder, do whatever. They, they had their vices. <laughs> now that they don't have a body, they have no sensation to feel those things, to experience those things. They just have memories that haunt them. So they are desperately looking for a body in order to use as a medium to be able to fulfill their lustful desires and to feel those sinful sensations again. And so it's, that's, that's what it's talking about, dry and waterless places. Looking for rest but doesn't find any. Because when you, when, you, when, you when you can't get your fix, you're restless. You're not at rest. You're fidgety until you get your score, until you get your fix. That's the way it is with a demon. Verse 44, then it says, I'll go back home where I came from. And when it comes and finds the house vacant, swept clean and put in order. That's when a person thinks that they're, when, when they're delivered and they're like, ah, I can finally rest now. Okay, if I clean the house once, does that mean that I don't have to clean ever again? Yeah, I wish it was true, but that's just not reality. You have to clean every day, every week. There's certain things that you do every day. There's certain things that you do every week because, you know, like one of the things that fascinated me in a little, as a little kid was dust. My mom would dust, but yet in the morning time, I would be sitting at the window and I'd see the sun, sunlight come in the window and I'd see all these dust particles floating. And by the end of the day, there would be dust where my mom just dusted. So, you know, and then just regular everyday living, running in and out of the house, you track in stuff. So just as you can't clean once and it be all done and everything's fine, spiritually speaking, once you clean yourself up, you've got to spiritually maintain that clean state. So you've got to stay clean. You've got to stay pure. you got to read your Bible. you got to study the Word. you got to fellowship with other believers. You've got to you know, participate in Bible study. You've got to pray. You've got to worship. You've got to do these things to maintain that spiritual cleanness. Now, again, works don't save you, but our salvation is maintained by our works. Because I guarantee you, I don't care how saved you are, if I stopped fellowshipping, I stopped praying, I stopped reading the Bible, where do you think my relationship with God would be in a year's time after that? Probably right back where it started. Yeah. Maybe worse. May, yeah, maybe worse than I was before. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not growing. I'm not edified. I'm not living victoriously. Maybe habits and vices and things come back into my life because of that. So it says, then it goes and um, then it says, I'll go back home where I came from. And when it comes and finds the house vacant, swept clean and put in order. So, first of all, the cleaning has to be maintained. Second of all, if a house is vacant, a demon is like, well, there's nobody occupying it. I'm going to squat here. So, where do you find homeless people in the wintertime? Abandoned houses, abandoned factories. They're squatting in places that are vacant. So, if you don't have the Holy Spirit occupying your heart and your mind, then your, your spirit is vacant. And it's prime real estate for a demonic entity to take up residence because a demon and the Holy Spirit, an evil spirit and a clean spirit can't live in the same body. So if you if you are filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, and the Holy Spirit is in you, active in you, and Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne of your heart, you know, then these demons don't have a chance on, on getting in. And you know what? Satan couldn't even dethrone God. He got booted out of heaven, but yet we as human beings, 
We're dumber and weaker than angels, but we have the power and the ability to dethrone God. Not saying that we can't go, we can go up to heaven and dethrone him, but we can dethrone God from the throne of our hearts. Because that's where we allow God to live. God to reside is in our hearts. Our throne is, or our heart is the throne of God. And we can say, yes, God, I want, you to, I want you to rule my life. I want you to be my king. I want you to live inside me. Or we can say, no, I don't want anything to do with you. It's our choice, our free will choice. So what Satan couldn't accomplish in heaven, we can accomplish within our spirit. We can dethrone God. And if God's not on the throne, who's sitting on the throne? Satan. That's really it. You say, well, no, I'm in control of my life. No, there is no middle ground because your fallen self is automatically in league with the devil. It's not redeemed. It's not regenerated. There's no straddling the fence. There's no I'm for myself. It's either one team or the other. Team God, team Satan. There is no in between. If you serve yourself, by default, you're serving Satan because who did Satan serve? Satan served himself. He's all about the self. So it says, then it says, I'll go back home where I came from. And when it comes, it finds the house vacant, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and brings along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and live there. And the man's last condition becomes worse than the first, so also will it be for this evil generation. So you have to have persistence. If you don't appreciate your healing, you don't appreciate your deliverance, it's not going to stick. It's not a one and done. Only Jesus, he's the son of God. He could do a one and done. But he even warned the disciples that they couldn't do a one and done. That it's different with us human beings. We do have the power and the authority of the name of Yeshua, of the name of Jesus. But in Matthew 17, 21, during that episode where you had the man who had the demon-possessed son, Jesus and uh, um, Peter, James, and John are on top of the mountain fellowshipping with Jesus. And, and, and getting to meet uh, Moses and Elijah. And the other disciples are dealing with this issue down on the bottom of the mountain where this guy has this demon-possessed son. And so all the disciples take a turn and try to cast out this demon. They can't do it. And then all of a sudden Jesus comes down. He says, Lord, please help me if you can. He's like, what do you mean if you can? You, you know who I am. And he says, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. So we finally cast the demon out. The boy's fine. The man and the son go away, and the disciples are like, well, whoa, 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 what, what's the deal? Why couldn't we do it? And he said, sometimes these things can only come out through prayer and fasting. So sometimes it takes a, a, a discip like discipline in a spiritual battle to, to be able for somebody to be delivered. Now, the person's got to want to be delivered. And they're, they're as much as part of the deliverance as you are assisting them in that deliverance. So even Yeshua said, that sometimes this, these things can only come about through prayer and through fasting. So uh, I'm going to go to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. We'll start with verse 1. Then Yeshua told them a parable to show that they should always pray and not be discouraged. He said, there was a judge in a certain city who neither feared God nor respected people. He was not a very good judge, was he? He was just out for himself. He enjoyed the power. He enjoyed the, the prestige, the reputation. Verse 3, then there was a widow in the city who kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my opponent. So this woman was persistent. She wasn't going to give up. She wasn't going to take no for an answer. This judge wasn't judging. He wasn't doing this lady justice. He was just ignoring her. But the lady wouldn't stop. Verse 4. He was unwilling at the time, but afterwards he said to himself, Although I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will, I will give her justice so that she won't wear me out with her incessant coming. Sometimes we've got to be persistent in our prayer, persistent in our efforts of deliverance, persistence in our effort of spiritual battle and spiritual freedom. This widow, she wanted justice. She wouldn't leave this judge alone. 
He tried to block her phone calls. He tried to put guards at the door. He tried to ignore her. But somehow, some way, she always got to him. Say, hey, what about my case? What about my case? What about my case? He's like, I don't give a rat's butt about this lady or her problem. But so she'll leave me alone. I'll finally give her what she wants. So she'll leave me alone. Isn't that what little kids do when they want something? They will bug you until they get what they want. They don't care if they get yelled at. They don't care if they get sent to the room. They don't care if they get spanked. And, and, and they won't leave you alone until they get what they want. If a child is that persistent, how much more so as spiritual grown adults should we be persistent in prayer in regards to spiritual warfare, in regards to healing, in regards to deliverance? Now, remember, the enemy is much more patient than you are. They've been around for over 6,000 years. They can wait. They can outweigh you. So are you going to be more tenacious than the demons? Are you going to make them tired of coming back over and over and over again? Or are you just going to say, oh, well, I give up. I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just put up with this. It's not so bad. Or are you going to be persistent until they leave you alone? Sometimes we give up too quickly, spiritually speaking. And it's because we've been misinformed and mistaught that it's a one and done deal. And if it doesn't work, then something's wrong with your faith. You didn't have enough faith. Faith's not the issue here. If you didn't have faith, you wouldn't be even rebuking. If you didn't have faith, you wouldn't be even asking or praying for deliverance. You have faith, therefore you're asking. But we just stop short. How many of us have lost loved ones that we used to pray for every day, but we're like, oh, I don't see a change in them. I don't see anything happening. They're never going to get saved. They never listen to me. And you just stop praying for them. Maybe you were that close to getting through to them. There's like this illustration of this, this cartoon of this guy that's in prison and he digs a hole and he's trying to dig out, you know, just to get to freedom. And he gives up just feet away from breaking through that wall. Because he's like, oh, there's no use. Oh, you know, I should have been there by now. And, they, and he gives up. He could have been free. But we give up too easily. So um, I will give her justice so that she won't wear me out with her incessant coming. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge is saying. Won't God do justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he'll be slow to help them? I tell you, he will quickly give them justice. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So an element of faith is not just having the faith to ask and believing it'll be done, but the persistence to keep on asking when it doesn't seem like your prayer is being answered. When it seems like the deliverance is not happening, when it seems like the healing is not occurring, is to be persistent. And in Luke chapter 11, there's another lesson about persistency that the Lord gives us. So in Luke chapter 11, starting with verse 5, Then Yeshua said to them, Which of you has a friend and will go to him in the middle of the night and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing set before him. Then, the one, uh, then from within he may answer, saying, Don't bother me. The door's already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't give up to give you anything. I tell you, even if the friend will not get up and give him anything out of friendship, yet because the man's persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. The guy said, No. Me and my kids are in bed. Leave me alone. But the guy kept knocking on the door. I need three loaves of bread. 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 How many of you, just to shut the guy up, would get out of bed and give him three loaves? Yeah, you want to go to sleep. And because of the persistence of this guy, the, the, it's like, okay, I'm his friend, but I'm not getting up because he's my friend. I'm getting up because I'm sick of hearing this guy knocking on my door asking for free three loaves of bread. So Yeshua is saying, be persistent here. So it says, I tell you, even the friend will not get up and give him anything out of friendship. Yet because the man's persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, 
and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be open to you. Now, that's kind of a poor translation in all honesty. Because the grammatically, the way it is in the Greek, it's keep asking, and it shall be given unto you. Keep seeking, and you shall find. Keep knocking, and the door shall be open to you. Keep doing it. Keep doing it until the question, keep asking until the question is answered. Keep seeking until you find what you're looking for. Keep knocking until that door is open to you. Now, again, this is all, let me preface this all. I'm not trying to be some sort of name it and claim it kind of guy. You know, sometimes the Lord says no and he means no. So if we're asking according to his will, is it, is it God's will that you be delivered from spiritual oppression? Of course it is. That's a no-brainer. You know, does he want you to walk in health? Yes. Doesn't mean he's going to heal you of everything. Because even Paul, the apostle, asked God to heal him and deliver him from something. And he says, no, 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 you need this. Because my grace is sufficient. Basically saying, Paul, if I deliver you from this, you're going to get a big head. And you're going to ruin your ministry. You need this to keep you humble. You know, so sometimes we have to deal with the grace being sufficient, but as far as spiritual warfare goes, as far as spiritual oppression goes, and demonic oppression, and demonic harassment, it's never God's will that they hang around to make you strong or to help you depend on God. But no, he wants you to have authority over these things. He doesn't want you to be spiritually oppressed or possessed. The only thing he wants you possessed with is by your willing choice of being possessed by the Holy Spirit. So I say to you, Keep asking, and it shall be given to you. Keep seeking, and you shall find. Keep knocking, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Now, I have a bad habit of losing things, and then praying, oh, God, help me find them, and I don't find them in the time frame I want them to be found, and I get mad. But I tell you, I have this little book. And I wrote down all my scripture memory verses in it. And I go through it every day trying to memorize a verse. Well, I lost it. I've got two. I've got one with King James Version, one with Christian Standard Bible Version. I lost my King James one. And I was looking for that. And I'm thinking, man, did I leave it at Harvest House? Did it fall out of, out of my pocket? And you know, Did it fall out of the car? I'm looking in my car. I'm looking everywhere. And I'm praying. And I'm praying. And I'm wanting to find it. And I get frustrated. And I'm like, ugh. You know, because I'm not finding it when I want it to be found. But then I said, Lord, I said, it'll be found in your time. Please help me to find this. You know that it's important to me. You know that it's because I want to memorize your word and hide your word in my heart that, so that I might not sin against you. So help me, Lord. Well, lo and behold, just the other day, when I wasn't even looking for it, I found it. Yeah. And it was what happened is it fell off my desk and it fell between my desk and a shelf. So it was in that little cranny, and it was dark, and I didn't know. And then I was reaching down to get something off the floor, and I was like, oh, there it is. And I grabbed it, and I kissed it for about five minutes, and I just said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But, but have you ever noticed when you lose something, you always find it in the last place you look? That's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you always find it in the last place you look. That's true. So um, let's see. So you have to outlast the demonic entities who are oppressing you or harassing you. Because like I said, they've been around for thousands of years and they are extremely patient. Now, let me turn to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. Now see how even the extra biblical texts will kind of butt up against and, and, and it will be supported by the canonical scriptures. So I thought this, this, uh, this story of Abraham turning away 70 times in one day these ravens that were sent by Satan to cause famine to eat up all the seed. And what does that story remind you of? The parable of the sower, right? Because there's different types of soil. It says the one that st uh, uh, sowed on stony ground, the birds, the ravens came up and ate them up. And it said, Jesus said that these birds represent Satan. And Satan inspired these ravens to eat up the seeds in Jubilees, chapter 11. So I just think it's neat how everything connects. So in Matthew chapter 15, 
starting with verse 21. Now Yeshua left from there and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman. Okay, she's not Semitic. She's not a child of Abraham. She's not from Isaac and she's not from Ishmael. She's not Jewish. She's not Hebrew. She's not Arab. She's Canaanite. She's from, uh, she's from Noah's son Ham. Behold, a Canaanite woman from the district came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, O master, son of David. My daughter is severely tormented by a demon. So here we have the, the, the father that had a son that was demonically possessed, and he was persistent, and the disciples couldn't do it, and then Yeshua finally did it. And now we have this Canaanite woman whose daughter is possessed, and she can't do anything. Verse 23 but he did not answer her a word. Huh. Kind of strange. Maybe a little rude of Yeshua, don't you think? A little snotty? What is it? You know, what's the deal here? I think he's really trying to teach a lesson to the disciples. Because the disciples are the ones that are prejudiced, right? They're prejudiced against Jesus talking to, uh, to uh, Samaritan women. He's, they're prejudiced against him acknowledging prostitutes, washing his feet. You know, I mean, they're all the ones that have a beef with all the other ethnic groups. Even one time, uh, uh, was it? I think it was James and John, were saying, Lord, they're rejecting you. We'll, 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 call down, we'll call down lightning and burn these guys up. And he's like, you guys are idiots. I'm just going to nickname you as the sons of thunder. Really? You want to waste these guys? Like, it was funny. So it says, but he did not answer her a word. And when his disciples came, they were urging him saying, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. They were getting uncomfortable with this lady crying out, Oh, master, son of David, my daughter is severely tormented by a demon. Okay, maybe you didn't hear me the first time. So she says it 20 more times and the disciples are getting nervous. Remember the same thing happened with the blind guys? They were shouting, son of David, have mercy on me. And people were like, shut up, just be quiet. They said, forget you. I know I can get healed. You know, you're not the one who's blind. I'm blind. They kept crying out until Jesus gave them attention and he healed them. Same thing with this Canaanite woman. Yeah, well, that was the 10, the 10 lepers. Yeah, the 10 lepers. Yeah. And so verse 24, but he responded. And, it, and, and the response was what the disciples were expecting Jesus to say. Right. And so, it, it, again, it seems like Jesus is being rude, but he, he's testing the disciples and he's testing the Canaanite woman all at the same time. But he responded, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Look, you're not even Jewish. Not only are you Jewish, you're not even Hebrew. You're not part of Judah. You're not part of the other 10 tribes that's been lost in Assyrian captivity. I come from the, for, for them guys, not you. You're Canaanite. So she came and got down on her knees before him. Okay, she was willing to not only cry out for help until it was uncomfortable for everybody hearing her and people wishing she would shut up. She not only, she humiliated herself and came down on her hands and knees before him and saying, Master, help me. And he answered and said, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Wow, that's, the, he's, he's really cutting to the quick. He's really cutting her down. Well, he's not, it's not like you're a dog like we think of you're a dog today. It was talking about household pets. We love our pets, right? We call our dog a dog. We're not insulting our dog, right? We treat them like little fur babies. Well, it's no different. I mean, they, they treated their pets very well too. And he says, it's, it's not right to give to the, uh, let me see. Yeah, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. You know, it's the children's got to eat. You know, the pets have their own food and we're going to feed the pet, you know. But she said, master. Yes, master, I agree with you. But even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. There was no five second rule in Israel. If it fall, fell to the ground, the dogs ate it. It was free game, right? She's saying, you know what? You may not give me the children's food, but they even eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. So this was showing not only her persistence, but it was showing her faith. Then answering, Yeshua said to her, oh woman, great is your faith. That's when the disciples rocked back on their heels. Oh, we, Jesus just played us. Yeshua said, oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be done to you as you wish. And her daughter was healed that very 
hour. Persistence. So let's not get discouraged if we haven't been healed right away. First of all, we got to seek if God even wants to heal us. If it's a Paul situation and it's so that we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, not get a big head and that we can experience how sufficient his grace is, that's one thing. So we got, you know, but as far as demonic spiritual warfare, oppression, possession goes, there's no question about it. The Lord wants us delivered. And if you were being attacked by the enemy, being harassed by the enemy, we can't give up. We've got to be more persistent than the demon is. You may have to cast that demon out 20 times. You may have to command them to leave 70 times in one day, just like Abraham had to command those ravens to leave 70 times in one day. But as long as you're the one that, until it's done, and then they get tired, like, man, this guy's not going to give up. Let's just leave this guy alone. Let's try another time or let's go to somebody else. Because we are promised the victory, but we're not promised the victory right away. How many battles were won in a day? I mean, how long was, was World War I? How long was the Civil War? How long was World War II? They were years. They lasted years. And some people fight their addictions for years. And sometimes people fight their demons for years. But as long as they don't give up and they're persistent, finally, they're going to get tired and they're going to go away. Because number one, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in your faith. There's power in praise and worship. There's power when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you're keeping your house maintained and clean. Then they're not going to keep coming back because they're going to get tired. And they're going to leave you alone. And that's what, that's what you have to do. We can't so, forget, we can never forget that God has given us that power. Yes. Right. We have the power and the authority in the name and blood of Christ. So, you know, you, this is how I'm teaching you how to tire out a demon. They know how to tire you out. Do you know how to tire them out? I just told you. Now, this is, this is a freebie. This is off, you know, the, the topic of the sermon. But I watched a very interesting documentary last night called Beware of Angels. And basically, it was about these, these two sisters who murdered their friends because an angel told them to. You want to know how it came about? Through a Bible study. Believe it or not. So these group of people got together and say, let's do a Bible study on angels. Oh yeah, we're all fascinated with angels. And then they started studying the scriptures on angels. And then they said, well, why don't we try to communicate with angels just like they did in the Bible? That's where they made their mistake. Guess what? The angels showed up. They did. They showed up. They cataloged supposedly over 40 some angels that visited them and communicated with them. And they gave them enough scripture and enough Bible to sound convincing and to keep red flags from going off in their head. They took them on spiritual journeys and they told them things of that was going to happen to them in the future. Then it started getting dark. He gave these two sisters the power to steal things and not get caught. Okay, when is it right to steal? Like, what, what's thou shalt not steal? Like, did you forget that one or something? And every time they would go in front of the security cameras, they would look different or they would be dressed different. And they would walk out with TVs. And then the angel told him, you know what? There's some people that claim to be followers of God, but they're totaled. Just like a car, they're totaled. It's not really them. It's a demonic spirit that's inhabited in them and pretending to be them. You need to, you need to kill them. And they went into a house and killed a, uh, killed a wife and a, a kid, and the guy survived, and the kid survived, but he was paralyzed. Um, don't you remember the scripture where Paul said, even if an angel comes to you, don't believe it? Even if an angel comes with a different message than us, don't believe it? What about the scripture that says that Satan himself can transform himself into an angel of light? He can look like a good guy. Beware. It was, this, it was this unhealthy fascination with angels. Angels are servants of God, and God uses them to help us. We are not, it is prohibited for us to attempt to contact angels. Because you don't know if you're going to contact a good angel or a bad angel. They've been around for over 6,000 years, maybe even longer in eternity. They are much wiser and cunning and smarter than we are. Unless, you know, and if an angel does come to you, there's a test for that. 
because an angel supposedly showed up and gave Muhammad a revelation, and we know what happened with that. Supposedly an angel visited jo Joseph Smith. We know what happened with that, created Mormonism. But if the angel comes and what he says doesn't line up with the word of God, you know it's, it's a fallen angel. You know that it's a demonic entity. You know that it's not an angel of God because an angel of God will never contradict the scriptures, will never contradict Jesus, never contradict God. So there's a test for that. We should not want to seek that. Isn't your relationship with Jesus Christ enough that you, that you think you have to have be spiritually titillated by a visitation from an angel? So I was thinking, man, two people were, a, a, a family was shot, gunned down by two sisters because of a Bible study. That's scary. It shows you how cults can rise up within churches because they get hyper-focused on the wrong things. And within that documentary, there was a few other stories of people that were into New Age. And they, they, they had special abilities. They had special powers. They can astral, astral project. They could levitate. They can do a lot of amazing things. And then it's, things started to turn dark. Then, then this, this uh, spiritual medium entity that this guy was communicating with was telling this guy to write checks to a New Age foundation. And the guy didn't have money to write the checks with. And he's like, what am I going to do? Like, I, I, you know, I, uh, there's no escape. He was thinking about killing himself. So that demonic entity that was posing as his spirit guide caused him to run to Christ. And he was freed and delivered. And, that, and when he was in communication with the spirit, this spirit told him to infiltrate fundamental Bible-believing churches and introduce transcendental meditation to them. To be a mole in the church, to pretend to be a Christian, get their confidence, and start teaching uh, false doctrine. Yeah, pretty crazy stuff. And it's no wonder that a lot of churches today are, are they have yoga classes in their church. You know, they, they have drag queen story hour in their church. They have all this stuff in their church that you're thinking, why in the heck is that there? What happened to the gospel? What happened to the Bible? And they've gotten off track because they've got focused on things other than the word of God. So, you know, just kind of putting that warning out there. And there's a lot of uh, churches out there that are not teaching. I've got a friend in Illinois, and him and his wife have been going to this church for a while. Well, they started teaching a Bible study class called Where the Church Got It Wrong. And it's, it's, it's all about wokeism. It's they're trying to introduce evolution and how evolution jives with the word of God. Uh, no. And trying to enter, and so every time he reads the chapter of the book that he's going to be teaching on, and he bones up on the truth of the word of God and comes back and challenges that guy. And I said, brother, I said, if this guy doesn't repent of what he's teaching, and if you can't change his mind, you're going to have to, you and your wife are going to have to leave that church because you know where that church is headed. It's, it's just like if you're in a plane or in a ship and you've got your course navigated but if you're off by one degree oh, one one degree is not that big of a deal but what's just one degree except go eight thousand miles yeah, and you're off by a rock. exactly that one degree after miles of travel turns into you know miles. yeah miles that you're off course yeah. and so just the one fudging on one thing of scripture where look supposedly the church got it wrong yeah. That one degree is, is that church goes down that path that's going to keep veering until it's a wide swath and they're off by a lot. And then that church is not even a church anymore. So I said, you either have to set these guys straight. And if they don't, you guys are going to have to leave and find a new church because you know where this church is going to head. And so it is it is it is not the congregants responsibility to just go to church and, and expect to be spoon fed. It's their church, it's their responsibility to go to church and be fed, but to go back and study what they've been taught to make sure what they've been taught is the word of God. Remember Paul and the Bereans? He says, the Bereans are more noble than anybody I've run into because you know what? I'm teaching them these new things and they're not accepting it at face value. They're going back and studying what I taught to make sure that what I'm teaching is true. Because guess what? I'm a human being. I can make a mistake. And if I do, I'll come back and correct it the best of my ability. 
But I try not to teach anything that I don't know, you know, that, that I, I got to make sure that I know what I'm talking about before I say it. And if I end up saying something wrong or by mistake, I'll, I'll do my best to correct it. But Paul was, was encouraged because they were studying the Bible outside of the realm of synagogue or Bible study or church or what have you. And they were making sure what Paul was teaching was correct doctrine. So it's your guys' responsibility to keep myself, to keep Aaron, to keep whoever you're sit under teaching in check. Whoever you're listening to on the internet or in the radio, to study what they're saying, to make sure what they're saying is true. Because if not, stop supporting them. Stop listening to them. Because you don't want to go off by one degree because one degree several miles down the road is going to be off by a lot. Uh, Chris, if, if that happens to a church, will God continue to allow it to happen or will he make things so that that church... No, he'll allow it to happen because we have free will. He's not going to interfere with our free will. You know, it's, it's just like... You know, for instance, just like um, a few years ago when a certain pastor preached that hell isn't forever. If I went to that church, that would be the last time I would go to that church. My, me personally. And remember, Aaron and I had to do a whole sermon to correct his false doctrine and his false teaching. Because it doesn't line up with the Hebrew, the Greek, or the scripture, or Orthodox Christianity. And just think how much damage he did. By preaching that message. Yeah, I, I was just, I was just thinking about the same church that we're talking about right now. Um, <clears throat> when they allowed their facilities to be used for getting the guy. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. Uh, like, would God prevail and say, uh, "Okay, that's it"? No, He's going to let it go. Happens, he's right? going to let it go because we have free will. We can do whatever we want, and He's not going to stop and interfere. It's the responsibility of the elders and the congregants of the church to say, whoa, 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 let's put on the brakes. We should double think this. Is this what we really should be doing? Is this what we really should be teaching? But no, the people of God has been convinced, oh, we're not as smart as our pastor. We're not as smart as our Bible teacher. After all, they went to seminary. After all, they've got a PhD. After all, so what? Mm -hmm. It's your responsibility to search out the word and make sure, keep them accountable, make sure that they're teaching the word of God. I expect the same thing from you guys for me. I, I wouldn't expect any different. Don't hold me to a different standard. Hold me, hold my feet to the fire. Make sure that I'm teaching and preaching the word of God. God will let a church go down its own path. He's not going to stop false doctrine in the church because it's the responsibility of the congregants to rise up against that false doctrine in the church, to challenge it. And if they don't agree, like what does the Bible say? You can so basically what this guy in, in Illinois is doing, he's gonna he's confronting the teacher. He's gonna meet with him private. I mean, he's confronting him in class, of course, when he starts teaching this ridiculousness. But then he's meeting with him in private, and if he doesn't accept his words in private, he's gonna bring two the two more with him. And if he doesn't, he's gonna bring him before the elders of the church and say, Look, you gotta change this. Because this ain't this ain't this ain't cool. And if that don't work, him and his family are most likely going to leave that church, See, find I, another church. I just read something about this in the book that you, I think you left here at Harris House in depth. I think it was called. Mm -hmm. it's by, by John. John Bevere. Bevere. Oh, Bevere, yeah. The Bait of Satan? No, it's not that book. It's another one that you had left here. Oh, okay. The catalog. It had to do with intimidation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. You remember the book at all? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, Breaking Intimidation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, yes. I, I'm reading that book right now, and just last night it talked about um, this sort of thing, and it, it told a story. The guy told a story of a church where um, <clears throat> the deacon or or somebody within a church started having a relationship with another woman. Uh huh. Okay, and and they're pretty open about it. And then some other when when, when other people saw this going on. Nothing was being done about it. They started doing stuff, and pretty much there was a whole bunch of people who were really living in sin. Uh -huh. And the uh, this pastor was this pastor and his wife were were talking to John about this, and he said, "You didn't tell these people they had to leave the church, right? They have to be kicked out of the church." Yeah. You, you allow it to happen, so I guess he's guilty too. Yeah. 
I'm just reading that last night. Yeah, well, it's interesting how that you know kind of plays into what we're talking about here. So it's almost like I preached two sermons tonight, you know. Because, <laughs> but anyway, I felt that was important to to address because. So many churches in, in, in our area and the surrounding areas are just falling by the wayside because they're not faithful to the scriptures. They're more worried about what the government or what the neighbors think about them than what God thinks about them. You know, and they, you know, they're, they're taking, you know, 2000 years of, of tradition and doctrine and just throwing it out the window and not giving it real consideration. You know, anyway, so let's go ahead and uh, close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us the power and the authority through the name and blood of Messiah Yeshua to combat any spiritual resistance that we may encounter from the enemy. But we've been fooled into thinking that it's a one and done deal and we've got to be persistent. We've got to be more persistent and more tenacious than the demons are that are oppressing us and attacking us and harassing us. We know it's your will that you want us to be free. So Lord, help us to be persistent, just like that widow that was persistent of getting justice from that unjust judge, just like that friend whose friend came in the middle of the night and he didn't have anything to offer him to be hospitable. And he knocked on his neighbor's door until he got those three loaves of bread. Just like the Canaanite woman who wasn't even a part of Israel, but she knew that Jesus had the answer and she pestered uh, him until he finally delivered that hit her daughter from demonic possession. Uh, it's the same thing. And to keep our house clean and keep it filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit and to maintain that cleanness so that whatever we cast out won't come back in. Lord, help us to be vigilant about this. And the more persistent we are, the less spiritual battles we'll have to continue to keep fighting and encountering if we continue to be persistent and maintain uh, chastity, cleanliness, and purity. And Lord, help us always stay in the word to be educated in your word so that whenever false doctrine is preached behind the pulpit, no matter where it is, that we can sniff out the counterfeit in a heartbeat and just rebuke it and say, uh, no, 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 that's not what the word of God says. That's why I misquote verses all the time to see if people are listening and to see if people will stop me and rebuke me for saying to, for quoting the scripture wrong. And I'm glad that most of the time they catch on. They're like, no, 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 that's not what it says. We've got to be Bereans. Teach us, Lord, to be Bereans because your word is our spiritual life. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.